Uh, I've been traveling for 17 years now, uh, but not always by bicycle. Um, I've been backpacking or living overseas and then took up cycle touring five years ago. I, I was living and working in Australia um, for 10 years. I lived in South Korea for a little over a year. And then just like backpacking trips in between. I would work for a couple of years and then I'd travel for a year. And, but now it's just uh, full-time travel for the last four years. Um, a lot. I think it's 70-something, um, mostly in South America, Southeast and Central Asia, Australasia and Europe. Not much of Africa, which is why I'm going in that general direction. My last backpacking trip was in South America and I began to see people, you know, cycling through the Salado Uni in Bolivia and, I, and I'd seen people in Australia um, when I was camper vanning. So I guess I'd begun to see bicycle tourism and it was somehow it was like in my field of vision but um, it wasn't until I was in Australia and, and looking for a trip I could do within Australia that I began to think of bike touring as something that I could do. That I was applying for Australian citizenship and so for that reason I couldn't leave the country at the time easily because of the application and I'd already travelled around Australia in a camper van but I was, I was ready to travel some more. I'd been working for two years, I was ready to quit my job and explore and there was parts of Australia that I hadn't been able to see in the camper van, like down dirt roads, you know, the dirt tracks through the desert. And I couldn't afford like a four wheel drive. So I began wondering if, if you could reach those places by bicycle. Um, so I began researching it. And I mean, it sounds ridiculous saying it now, but I didn't know at the time, but yeah, you absolutely can ride through the desert. Um, so that was what instigated the trip. Um, I've always enjoyed just being on the move. So, you know, whether it's sitting on the Trans-Siberian train or sitting on an Amazon boat or just sitting on a bus in the Philippines, just, just moving slowly through a place is what I enjoy a lot. And with bicycle touring, obviously it's incredibly cheap with, you know, if you're staying in a tent um, and I enjoy how much food I get to eat while bicycle touring. So all, all of those things combined to make it uh, just ideal for me. Um, well, it's it's a Vivente gig, and it's got a um, roll-off internal hub in the back, which is still going after 60,000 kilometers. And I've got a Dynamo hub in the front, which I replaced at about 50,000 kilometers. And then I recently converted, because the frame is belt drive compatible, um, I converted over to belt drive back in Athens about 2,000 kilometers ago. So that's been really nice, switching to, to the belt drive much smoother. When I bought the bike five years ago, it was available, you could buy the bicycle with the carbon belt, but I just thought it was too new and too weird. Yeah. And then I've sort of regretted it a bit ever since, like, oh, I should have got the belt drive. So with, um, I have a new frame. So when the frame was, when my new frame was belt drive compatible, I thought, terrific, now is the time I can switch to a carbon belt. I really like it because I would always, I would never look after my chain and it would get old and it would get really crunchy. The, go the cog and the chain didn't sit well together and I think there was a lot of resistance and dirt. Um, so because I'm very lazy with maintenance, this belt requires like next to no maintenance. So it's so smooth and yeah, I feel I feel like it's easier than the chain. I mean, if you're replacing your chain every 5,000 kilometers, they reckon this carbon belt should last like 30,000 to even 50,000 kilometers before I have to change the belt or the cogs. My, my life before bicycle touring, um, I was living and working in Australia for about 10 years and I had a job that involved travel. So I would fly out every week or two and then fly home every week or two. So I was constantly on the move. I was living out of a backpack for all of those years. I haven't had a settled place for, for many years now. So I've always been on the move. Um, and of course that job suited me perfectly. Um, but I don't, I, won't, I, don't, I don't have any plans to return to that particular job. Um, my plan is to just stay bicycle touring. This is how I plan to continue for as long as my body will allow. It's it's a mixed it's mixed really. Um, on the one hand, if you can feel more threatening, you can feel more um, vulnerable. Um, but of course, like men are at, solo men are at risk as well. I think a lot of it is a solo traveller concern, not a female. There is an extra layer for female travellers, but. 
solo travelers have to be cautious in any case. And I do think that as a woman, um, I probably get more positive responses for warm showers applications than I do that than, than a gap than a than a man would. You know, when people meet me, they say, "Is it just you? Are you on your own?" Okay, come and stay. But I think if I was a man or if I was a couple, including a man, I don't think I would receive as many of those invitations. I think people don't find me threatening, so are more willing to to welcome me. So. It, it, it's, it has positives and negatives. If I don't plan properly, if I don't pick a good campsite, maybe I'm running late and the sun's setting and I just think, oh, I just have to camp somewhere. Um, yeah, sometimes I don't feel particularly safe. Mm -hmm. And um, and then the next day I promise myself that I'm going to do better and always arrive earlier and make sure I have a safer place. Last year in North Macedonia, exactly what I've just alluded to happened. I arrived at a lake too late in the day, the sun was setting, and I thought the lake, I've misread the map, I thought the lake was just empty and rural and I could just pitch my tent anywhere, but there was lots of houses, and yeah, it was it was really almost dark, so I just found like an empty block of land and started pitching my tent. It was like fenced off, it was like obviously like a property, like, but it wasn't, it wasn't occupied, it was like empty, empty of a house, but there was neighbors with properties. So I heard somebody like calling through the bushes. I had the tent set up. Somebody called me through the bushes. And so I followed the voice and said, come here. And they said, are you on your own? Said, yeah. Said, come here, come here, come here. And they, I followed the voice through the bush. And when I got through, um, there was a man pointing a gun at me. So <laughs> what happened was um, he phoned a relative who, like a lot of Macedonians, they have relatives living overseas that speak English. He didn't speak English. Um, and through his son, the interpreter in English, we were able to to um, sort of diffuse the situation. And the, what his son explained to me over the phone was that it's just so weird for somebody to be cycling in Macedonia. Like this man just couldn't understand. He thought I must be up to something much more subversive than just cycling and being in a tent. Like I must be up to something. And then once it was all diffused, he was like, I mean, I absolutely lost it. I just, like once the city, once the gun wasn't pointed at me ever, anymore, once everything had calmed down, like I absolutely just broke down into tears. And then the man was like so, so kind. He was like, "Is there anything I can do? Would you like some wine? I'm so sorry." So it was, you know, it was a misunderstanding. But misunderstandings with guns, are obviously, terrifying. Mm -hmm. Right now, I've been invited. Um, by a chap named Erin who has been on my Instagram for a little while. He welcomed me when I arrived in Turkey through Instagram and he has been organizing this festival which he's invited me to. I've been staying in his home for like three or four days during the festival and um, it's been absolutely magnificent. I've, I don't normally cycle in a group. We've been on group rides, we've had meals together, we've been to concerts, some boats rides and it's just been an absolutely wonderful experience they've completely just embraced me into their household and into their festival and this is just quite standard in turkey like people in turkish people are just so welcoming and i'm absolutely blown away but yeah this is a an absolutely brilliant highlight the, the other fellow cyclists i've met it's just been a wonderful experience the people that do cycle in in turkey are, are very passionate about it and they're very well connected everybody every turkish cyclist knows every other turkish cyclist it seems to me but it's not i mean you don't see as many cyclists as you do in germany for example i'd returned to the uk from the previous year i'd cycled up to the north cape and back and i'd returned home for Christmas and get to go to a wedding and so I was preparing to set off again to Istanbul which I'd actually been trying to cycle to for three years at this point this was my third attempt and this was March early March of 2020 and Covid was just beginning to be in the news um, but I, I completely misread the situation having been accustomed to like the British press only reporting about Brexit and now the press was only reporting about Covid I just thought that and they couldn't report like on multiple subjects anymore and they were just you know obsessed with this one thing and I set off thinking well I just I suppose I can't go to Italy this year that's what I thought when I set off in the start of March and then two weeks later I was in lockdown in in Germany for seven weeks 
Fortunately, I had a friend who was living in Munich at the time. And so when when lockdown, when it became apparent lockdown was looming, I was in Germany. So I contacted him and said, hi, remember me? Um, if this gets crazy, can I come and stay? And he said, yes. And probably we thought it would be for a week or two, uh, but I was there for seven weeks, yeah. So after that, um, so that was April, May of 2020. And then from that point, I planned to get to Istanbul and well beyond, like within 2020. But of course, since everything changed then, I've had to, um, I've had to obviously change my route plan. I've had to change my scheduling. And so what was supposed to take about six months has actually taken about 18 months. And, and now I just sort of, I went in the direction that the borders opened. If I couldn't go this way, I went that way. And I've just slowly, slowly made my way yeah. to my final destination, my final point of Istanbul and then beyond. But I just, a very different, very longer tour. I, well, I love it. I mean, and also like waking up in a tent every day, you have to, you have to go somewhere. Like, I mean, I'm, but I enjoy doing it every day. I, I enjoy the ride. I enjoy moving. Every day, there's a new, like in this particular part of the Aegean, there's some more um, Roman ruins or Greek ruins to see. There's new food to try. There's new people to meet. So there's a new adventure every single day. There's not. I don't think I've ever woken up and gone, oh, I have to cycle today. So my current plan, as I say, is um, Africa. I would love to cycle down the east of Africa and then up the west. I would love to spend two or three years doing that. Um, I would like to arrive there by land, if at all possible. So now that Iran appears to be issuing tourist visas again, I, if I could go through Turkey to Iran and then I would like to take a boat to the UAE, that relies on that, that border crossing reopening, of course into Saudi Arabia, and then I could enter Jordan, Israel, and then Egypt that way. Um, that was my original plan for 2020. Um, so if I can start doing that again now, that would be superb. But one way or another, um, cycling around Africa. If I have to get a plane there, that would be annoying. But um, yes, I would like to cycle down the east and then up to the west coast of Africa. Next. No, I haven't worked in four years now, um, in a conventional sense. Um, for the last three and a half years, I've just been like depleting my savings. Um, but in the last six months, I've opened a Patreon and PayPal accounts. So now for the last six months, my expenses are sort of, it's half covered by savings and half covered by Patreon and PayPal subscriptions. 100, 100 Australian dollars a week, which is about 60 euros a week, I think, these days. Um, so that takes you to like 5,200 bucks for the year. And then I have like a separate kitty of like 1,800 bucks for like, you know, plane tickets or like big bicycle maintenance costs. So the two combined make $7,000 a year, which is, I guess, about 4,000 euros. Ortley wrote to me um, and asked if they could use my photos. And so we had a sort of a sponsorship arrangement last year where they sent me some panniers and I tagged them in, in a certain number of photos every month. Um, but otherwise, no, no official sponsorship. Um, to start easy, like not to start off like on a, on a really big trip um but to start gently maybe like a and this i mean i'm saying this because this is exactly what i didn't do um it would be better to to go on a, a short overnight um and you don't need to have like a fancy bike obviously it helps with you know reducing the amount of maintenance that you do um but yeah just smaller trips on whatever whatever bicycle you've got with whatever gear you've got and then you can you can start adventuring on longer trips i was really fortunate in that Somehow, or like maybe I just, I guess, correct, or maybe I was just lucky, but I just, I was very confident that I was going to take this. And so I bought a very fancy bike so that um, I wouldn't have to do any repair work. And yeah, fortunately, it, it paid off because I've, I've absolutely loved it for the last five years. But you don't need to, you don't need to wait to buy the expensive bike or to have all the good equipment. You can just go with what you've got and, and take it from there.